London again. I was last here, I think, in 1992, so it's, it's quite a while since uh, I annoyed you by uh, coming in, in amongst you. Now, brothers and sisters and young people, we've got a very, as Ron said, a very interesting subject before us tonight, and that is looking at the way in which we should live our lives today. We should be living our lives today in the vision of the kingdom. And I want to take you back straight away to a pretty well-known passage in the Old Testament, to Proverbs chapter 29 and verse 18. If you come back there and just share for a few moments with me what this passage is really telling us. Proverbs chapter 29 and verse 18. You know, we can take this one verse and, and analyse it, which we're going to do, or we can read it in its context, which is probably a wiser thing to do. You know, the context is pretty clear, isn't it? You look at verse 14 of Proverbs 29. The king that faithfully judgeth the poor, his throne shall be established forever. Now, kings are not wont to judge righteously, and especially to judge the poor righteously. History shows that. But a wise king who looks down the corridor and says, if I do the right thing by my people and I operate now in a way that will ensure their future, they will ensure mine. And they will want my dynasty to continue. So here's a, here's a man who's wise. He looks into the future and makes decisions about how that should affect his ways now. Read on, verse 15. The rod and reproof give wisdom, but a child left to himself bringeth his mother to shame. You know, I used to chastise my children, not because I was angry with them, I was disappointed when they misbehaved and when they rebelled. I chastised them for one reason. I wanted to give peace to their mother and peace to their God. And that's why I chastised them. So I looked down the corridor to the time when they would be teenagers and dealt with them when they were five, six, seven, eight, etc. Because I knew that it would pay dividends. In that matter, I followed the scripture. In others, not always. Let's read on. Let's come down to verse 20. Seest thou a man that is hasty in his words, there is more hope of a fallen of him. In other words, here's someone who doesn't think about the consequences of what he's saying. He doesn't think, well, if I say this now, that's going to cause me trouble later on. Have a look at verse 21. He that delicately bringeth up his servant from a child shall have him become his son at length. Now, masters, especially ancient masters, were not always inclined to deal kindly with their servants, their slaves. They were slaves. But the wise master would say, if I deal kindly with my slave and treat him justly, who want to serve me forever? So here is a man who's looking down the track, he's looking down the corridor of time and saying, what do I need to do today to secure the future? Got the context? That's where verse 18 fits in. And verse 18 says this, where there is no vision, the people perish, but he that keepeth the law, happy is he. Now this word vision here is the Hebrew word chazam. It means mental sight. Now, one of the things that God gave to human beings he did not give to the animals, as far as we can tell, is he gave them the ability to create pictures in their brain. And I know what that's like. I can create incredible pictures in my brain. And the ones that come from my natural resources are not all that good. I certainly wouldn't want to publish them to you. But that's the ability I have. And you've got that ability, haven't you? You can create images on the screen of your brain, and they're very vivid. That's what he's talking about. That's why 85% of the Bible is prophecy. Yes, 85% of it is prophecy. It's designed to create pictures in your brain. That's why you've got the detail in Ezekiel chapter 40 to 48, and we'll go there briefly later on. Detail, which when we read it, what's this all about? Well, work at it. Because if you work at it, you create a vivid picture. And I've walked around Ezekiel's temple, not literally, but because I've made a detailed study of it. I've walked around, I can actually reach out and touch it. It's real. That's why God put it there. See, so we've got that ability 
to create pictures. And he says, where there is no vision like that, the people perish. Now this word perish is the Hebrew word para. It means to loosen, to expose, to dismiss, as the idea of course of nakedness at the end. Rotherham says, the people is let loose. Young's literal translation said, without a vision is a people made naked. And we don't want to be found naked at the return of Christ, do we? Spiritually naked. How can you avoid spiritual nakedness? Well, by having a vision of the kingdom which governs the way you live today. Looking down the corridor and saying, I am confident that these things are going to happen. I know they're going to happen. So they are the true realities, not what I see around me. And when that is what governs your life, then you will live in the vision of the kingdom. You will live for the kingdom. And this is all about faith, isn't it? It's about faith. But you know, there's a huge contrast between people who live like that and people who live as they were born naturally. Proverbs chapter 4, verses 18 and 19 makes this point. It says that the path of the just is as the shining light that shineth more and more unto the perfect day. You know, the perfect day is the day of the kingdom. Can I just ask you a question? I'm not meaning to put you in an you know, uncomfortable seat, but I do want to ask you a question. Just go back five years in your life. Now, for the young people, this might not be quite so appropriate. One or two years in your life. But for the older ones amongst us, go back five years in your life and just ask yourself a genuine question. Is your vision and therefore your expectation of the kingdom brighter today than it was five years ago or one year ago or two years ago? Now, be honest with yourself. I don't want an answer from you. But if your answer is no, it's not, well then maybe this verse doesn't apply to you. You see what it says? The path of the just is as a shining light that shineth more and more unto the perfect day. So it increases as we get closer because the expectation rises. You can see it coming and you want it to come. But the way of the wicked is as darkness. They're receding. They're going into darkness, you see. Whereas the righteous, who have got a vision, are increasing in their understanding. And their path becoming brighter and brighter. The wicked don't know at what they stumble. Now, there are only two ways. You know, there is no such thing as treading water in the truth. You don't mark time in the truth. There's no such thing as neutrality in the truth. So you're either going forward or you're going backwards. Now, my experience of life and the truth is three steps forward and two steps back. However, providing you're making the one step forward, well, then you are making progress. But there is no such thing as treading water or marking time. You're either going forward to the kingdom or you're receding back to where you came from, darkness. And of course, the Lord Jesus Christ said as much, didn't he, when he said in Matthew chapter 7 that there is such a thing as a broad way, a very broad way, and of course the bulk of humanity have chosen, some, of course, most out of pure ignorance, they've chosen that way, some deliberately have chosen that way, knowing better things. And there's another way, it's a narrow path, and it's a path that leads to the perfect day. That is what we want to talk about tonight. We want to talk about living in the vision of the kingdom. Now here's another very simple verse. I'm going to give you the simple ones first and then we're going to challenge you a bit more later on. I want you to come to Hebrews chapter 11. Now you can recite this one backwards, can't you? Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 1. And so we should because this is the primary verse in our Bibles about what faith is. So let's analyse it and see if we can extract from it what the Apostle Paul was saying. He says in Hebrews 11 verse 1, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Now as you can see behind me, this word substance is the Greek word hypostasis. It means a setting under, a support, a foundation, or confidence. 
And Brother Thomas translates this passage this way. You can see it there in the blue. Faith, he says, is the confident anticipation of things hoped for, a full persuasion of things not seen. The Revised Version adds giving of substance to things hoped for. So you see, what faith does is it makes things that you cannot see with your eyes, because they don't exist today, except in the mind and purpose of God, you can't see them with your eyes, but faith allows you to make those things more real than what you can see with your eyes. I'm going to talk tonight about the great realities, because let me just say to you, and I think most of you are sensitive to this fact, the things that are happening around us and the things that are happening within our community are telling us, they're in fact shouting at us, that we are close to the return of Christ. And what we see today and what we experience today, the homes in which we live, the halls in which we meet, is all now, very shortly, going to recede into the distant past when we stand in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ in the day of judgment. All of that will be put in the right perspective then. And we'll see it for what it's worth then. And the great realities of the future will come into view. The first one will be that Jesus Christ does actually exist, that he is immortal, and that he has come from the right hand of God to judge his household. Judgment must begin at the house of God. And if it first begin at us, what shall be the end of those that obey not the gospel of God, says Peter. It will be the great reality. And beyond that, there is the great reality of the kingdom. The great reality of the temple in which all nations will worship for a thousand years and in which you and I, if we are there, will operate as kings and priests. They are the great realities. How real are they in our minds? And do they govern the way we behave today? The choices we make today? That's a question that only you can answer. Now, the next word that we want to fo focus on is this word evidence. It's the Greek word elekos. It means logical proof or evidence or demonstration or a convincing argument. He's talking, of course, about the power of the word of God to produce a rigid conclusion that things actually happen. And because they actually happen, as God said they did, it's a guarantee that what he says is going to happen in the future will happen. That's what faith is about. So faith, says Brother Thomas, is reality and proof. That's how he interprets these two words. Substance, reality. Evidence, proof. Faith is reality and proof. The person who has it embraces certain things promised as realities and certain transactions as things proved. Now that is what we must have. Nobody will be in the kingdom without faith. Faith comes, of course, and it's developed in different degrees in different people. But without faith, says verse 6 of this chapter, it is impossible to please God. And, of course, the Apostle Paul tells us that faith has these two elements in it. In verse 6, he says, For he that cometh to God must believe that he exists, so there's the first thing. You know, I, I know many people, many, many people who believe that God exists, but they don't believe the second element. And the second element is this, and that he is a rewarder of them who diligently seek him. There's plenty of people who believe that God exists, but there are much fewer who really believe that he's a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. And if you have got a strong, clear vision that is real, then you are likely to serve him as one who will reward you for that kind of faith when the time is right. So here it is. This is just one little brief picture of the true reality that is before us. And we now need to live in the vision of the kingdom, to live as though we really believe that, that we know it's coming. And that's one reason why we read tonight from Revelation chapter 10, because of all the visions that are in the Word of God, and there are 
there are squillions of them, if I might use that word. This one really touches me. It is the vision of the mighty rainbowed angel of Revelation chapter 10. So let's just spend a few minutes to see if we can make this real. Yes, to be sure, it's symbolic language, but in actual fact, its accomplishment is going to be through real people like you and me. Now, what is this vision all about? Well, we read in verse 1, And I saw another mighty angel come down from heaven, clothed with a cloud, and not a rainbow, but as it should read, the rainbow was upon his head. Now, of course, all of us know that the rainbow has seven colours. But this rainbow has a particularly strong, dominant colour. You know what that is? Well, let's come back to chapter 4, uh, to the fourth chapter. Don't lose chapter 10, but chapter 4, verse 3, tells us this. This is the vision of Christ sitting upon the throne, surrounded by his saints. In Revelation 4 and verse 3, we read this. And he that sat was to look upon like a jasper and a sardine stone. And there was a rainbow round about the throne in sight, like unto an emerald. Now, of course, emerald is green. So the predominant colour of this rainbow is green. I wonder why. Well, green is the biblical colour for immortality. Just like in a couple of months' time, all of your dead or seemingly dead grass and trees are going to blossom in the spring and everything will turn green, won't it? What's that tell you? Life. New life. So green is the colour of immortality. So we have this angel, he's got this rainbow above his head. And we know how rainbows are formed. They're formed by the rays of the sun being refracted in the tiny droplets of water that form clouds. And of course all of those elements are here. We have this one with a face like the sun. It's the sun of righteousness. So we're beginning to build this picture. The cloud, of course, symbolises a multitude. We know that from passages like Hebrews 12 and verse 1. We are surrounded, says Paul, by a, a cloud of witnesses. We know from Ezekiel chapter 38 and verses 9 and 16 that the Gomian Confederacy comes down upon the land like a cloud to cover the land. We know it's a great multitude, multitudes, multitudes in the valley of decision. So a cloud symbolises a multitude. There's no question about the multitude here. Clouds are normally white, aren't they, except when they're bearing heavy rain. White is the, is the symbol, the colour, for righteousness. So here we've got a righteous multitude who enshroud this mighty angel who has a face like the sun. Christ, of course, is called the sun of righteousness. So here we are, brothers and sisters and young people. If we're going to be in the kingdom, then this is our first work. Having been taken as the bride of Christ, he will form us into an army and for 40 years, we are going to go out and bring this world under the control of our Lord Jesus Christ. That is the work that is before us. It is a work, of course, of great moment because it will see the establishment of the kingdom of God. Now, what about the angel's feet? Well, it says at the end of verse 1, And his feet were as pillars of fire. Brother Thomas calls them pedal pillars of fire. Now, fire is the biblical symbol for judgment. And feet, of course, are what you use to walk or march. But this angel, when we see him in verse 1 and 2, has actually concluded his march. He's come to the end of his career of 40 years of judgments. How do we know that? Well, just read on verse 2. And he had in his hand a little scroll. That's how it should read. A little scroll open. So when you look at this picture, this is what you have. He has in his hand a little scroll. And it's open. Now when you open a scroll, we know this from chapter 5, you actually fulfil what's contained, what's written in it. So this angel's work has been performed. The scroll has been unrolled. It's a little scroll because it's a little period of time in comparison with the seven sealed scroll of chapter 5, which of course went on for thousands of years. This only goes for 40 years. The 40 year period of divine judgment. And it's been played out in the earth through the activity of this mighty angel who has used his pedal pillars of fire 
to march through the earth, to walk to and fro through the earth, Zechariah chapter 1, and to subdue the nations. But now he's stationary. See what it says in verse 2? And he set his right foot upon the sea and his left foot upon the earth. So the right foot is upon the Mediterranean Sea, that is, he has subdued the nations in and around the Mediterranean. Of course, his first major victory is over the Gobian Confederacy in the land. And of course, the left foot on the earth, this is the Roman earth that's being referred to. In other words, the nations of Europe who will revolt against the rule of Christ for 40 years until they are finally crushed that's what Revelation chapters 14 through 19 are all about. So here we've got the work of the mighty rainbowed angel at the end of his career. But there has been a career. And it's a career in which seven thunder judgments have been poured out. Let's just read on. Verse 3. And he cried with a loud voice and when, as when a lion roareth. And when he had cried, seven thunders uttered their voices. And when the seven thunders had uttered their voices, I was about to write. And I heard a voice from heaven saying to me, Seal up those things which the seven thunders uttered and write them not. We'll come back to that point in a moment. But these seven thunders, of course, are going to be played out. So here they come, the seven thunders, uttering their voice. Now seven thunders is drawn from Psalm 29, by the way. If you go back, we haven't got time to do that now. But you go back and have a look at Psalm 29. And you will find that seven times in that psalm, the phrase, the voice of Yahweh, is used. And it's in the context of the voice of Yahweh thundereth. You know what the Jews used to call thunder? You got it. The voice of God. So the voice of Yahweh thunders seven times to bring these judgments upon humanity. And finally, when that 40 years is up, the angel can stand victorious on sea and earth. So here we have the vision that is before us. Now what about John's position in relation to all of this? Well, he's there to represent you and me. In verse 4, he's told to seal up those things and to write them not. Why can't he write them? Are these things too awful to be written? No. That's not the reason, because I can show you some pretty awful things from the rest of the Bible as to what's going to happen in this 40-year period of divine judgment. That's not the reason, but there is a reason. And the reason is provided for us over the page in Revelation chapter 10, verses 8 and 9 and 10. We read this. And the voice which I heard from heaven spake unto me again and said, Go and take the little scroll which is open in the hand of the angel, which standeth upon the sea and upon the earth. So you've got a picture in your mind? Now just imagine that you're John, because he's there to represent you. You know what he calls himself in chapter 1? Your companion in tribulation. So he's there on your behalf. So we're going to see in a moment that Ezekiel, back in the book of Ezekiel, there on our behalf. And what's John told to do? Well, this voice tells him, to approach the angel, to take a scroll, and to eat it up. When was the last time you ate a newspaper? Or even a Bible? A page of the Bible? Well, we don't do that, do we? This is a rather unusual request, isn't it? So John's told to eat it. Why? Well, let's read on, verse 9. And I went unto the angel and said unto him, Give me the little scroll. And he said unto me, Take it, and eat it up, and it shall make thy belly bitter, but in thy mouth it shall be as sweet as honey. And he found exactly that to be the case. It was sweet in his mouth as he was eating the scroll, sweet in his mouth, but bitter in his belly. You know, when we are invited to be involved in the judgments of our God upon this earth, brothers and sisters and young people, it's not going to be an extremely pleasant experience. It's actually going to be quite a bitter experience. But we will agree, absolutely, that it's right. It will be sweet in our mouth. We will know that what's happening is just and true and right. 
sweet but bitter in the execution. And this is the reason why John was not allowed to write these things down. They were not to be outside of him. He was not to act as though, well, this is something, well, you know, it's interesting, but, you know, I can pass that bottle. John, if you're going to be involved in these things, they have to become part of you. You have to live in the vision of the kingdom. You see, that's the point, isn't it? That's the principle here. They must become part of you. They can't be outside of you. Go and take the little scroll. Does the angel walk up to John and say, Look, open your mouth and shove it down his throat? No. John has got to go to the angel. What does that mean? He wants to be part of this angel community. He go, he takes the initiative. He wants to be part of it. He says, give me the scroll. I want to be there in that day when this is unrolled and divine judgments are poured out upon the earth to establish the kingdom. Give me the scroll. Is that your attitude? You see, that's the question we've got to answer, isn't it? Because if we're living in the vision of the kingdom, that is our attitude. We can't wait for that day to approach the angel, so to speak, and to grab the scroll and say, give me the scroll. And eat it up. Do you think this is a new experience? Well, it's not a new experience. Because we're going to find in a moment that Ezekiel went through this. So what's this all about? Well, you just follow the chart as it unfolds. Now, I think it's pretty obvious how this chart, some of you have seen this before. We work from the left-hand side, the yellow strip, the vertical strip, which speaks about the return of Christ and the resurrection of the dead. We come across to the right-hand side, and we've got Christ's universal rule over all nations. From the resurrection of the dead to his universal rule over the nations will be 50 years. Now, I know that the young people, you say 50 years, are they? 50 years? That's hideous. Well, wait till you get to my age. 50 years doesn't sound too long. But anyway, 50 years is what God has provided for this period, from the resurrection of the dead to the time when Christ has absolute control in the earth. Now you can divide this period up into two parts. We know that the last 40 years of the 50 is the time of divine judgment. We'll speak briefly about that later on. So Armageddon occurs here, which of course leaves 10 years for the work of the judgment seat, which only lasts a year or so, of the marriage of the Lamb, a year for the rejoicing of Christ with his bride in which he will go around and personally meet and probably embrace every single member of his bride. And there's going to be a few of them. It's going to take him a year. The law prescribed that. Deuteronomy 24 verse 5 said, when a man takes a wife, he doesn't do anything for 12 months. You don't send him to war. He cheers up his wife for 12 months. Wouldn't that be great today? Well, Christ is going to do that. He's going to go around and meet every one of his bride in that 12 month period before they prepare for war. So this is how this 10 years is going to be eaten up. Of course he has things to do before Armageddon as we're going to see. So there's the judgment seat, there's the marriage and the preparation. It's going to see the revelation of Yahweh's Sabaoth in the earth. But his power and glory will not be seen for most of that time. His power in terms of the use of judgment, yes. But the saints' glory will be withdrawn until the evening period. Now, the first work that Christ has to be involved in is the sending forth of Elijah. That starts before Armageddon, and of course it's a work of the second exodus of Israel, which goes on for 40 years, just like the first exodus of Israel. He also has a work amongst the Arabs in the Sinaitic region before Armageddon, and the smiting and healing of Egypt, events which I believe have already begun. Isaiah 19 is already underway in the events that we've seen in the last three weeks. Isaiah 19 is clicking away right now. And it won't be too long before the next stage of that will be in play. And of course, Armageddon has got to fit in there and 40 years for the conversion of Egypt, which is what Isaiah 19 is all about. 
Then comes Armageddon, and of course that's the time when God is destroyed. His forces are buried in the land. Judah, at least one third of them, are saved. And of course it's the beginning also of a ten year period of proclamation to the nations in which the saints will go out and they will make their appearance to both the rulers of the world and to the ordinary populace. That's why it's called a mid-heaven proclamation. Heaven is the government, the earth is the people. It's a mid-heaven proclamation because they will talk to the governments and they will talk to the people. Why do you think that's necessary? Well, what if the saints were to go out after Armageddon to the European nations, for example, and say to the European leaders, who we know will revolt against Christ's rule, look, uh, tell your people that there's a king in the earth who demands your subjection. You reckon the European leaders would say, yeah, we'll go and tell our people? Yeah. That's why it's got to be a mid-heaven proclamation. Tell the, tell the leaders and tell the people nobody's got an excuse. No one. You rebel against Christ's rule after that, you deserve the judgments that are coming. So for 10 years the saints will do that work and then of course comes the hour of judgment of Revelation chapter 14 and verse 7. Starting with the destruction of Rome, Revelation 14 verse 8, Catholic Europe is then progressively destroyed by the returning Jews coming back to the land under Elijah. They are the weapon. They are the arrow of Zechariah chapter 9 and verse 13 that strikes through the heart of the enemy. And of course while all this is going on, sensible nations like Britain and Australia and Canada, probably America, will submit to the rule of Christ immediately after Armageddon and get involved in the building of the house of prayer for all nations. And when all of this has been nearly accomplished and the papacy has been revealed with its system to be the heart system that it is, Christ will reveal his bride to the world in the marriage supper of the Lamb. So it's going to be something like nearly 50 years after the marriage of the Lamb that the supper will be held. But to wait a while for your meal. You know, marriages today in Australia go for about 8 to 10, sometimes 12 hours. And between the ceremony and the time that you sit down for what they call the breakfast, the, the, the wedding breakfast, can sometimes be four hours. Four hours. You believe that? We're stupid in Australia. Anyway, <laughs> that's what it's like, see? So you have a ceremony and then you have the marriage supper. So you've got a bit of a feel. Now, how do we know that there's going to be a 50-year period? If you've got a thinking cap, pull it on because you're going to need it shortly. All right? We're going to talk about this. We're going to come back to Ezekiel chapter 1. We'll talk about this 50-year period. Ezekiel chapter 1 is the beginning, of course, of this magnificent book. It speaks eloquently about our role in the future. Young people, if you really want to get your teeth into something that will make the future real, and why don't you make a study of portions, at least, of Ezekiel's prophecy? Start with chapter 1, and then get into chapters 40 to 48. It's absolutely magnificent what's here in this book. So in Ezekiel chapter 1, we read this in verse 1. Now it came to pass in the 30th year, in the fourth month, in the fifth day of the month, as I was among the captives by the river of Kibar, that the heavens were opened, and I saw visions of God, Anyone know what the word God there is? No takers? It's Elohim. Elohim means mighty ones. So when you read that, you're reading about yourself. You know that? I saw visions of mighty ones. He means those who will be the cherubim. Because that's what's next described. The saints in glory. Okay, he's talking about you. So it's very important to us. So he gives us here a couple of dates. He says in verse 2, In the fifth day of the month, which was the fifth year of King Jehoiachin's captivity. Now this is about the last period of Judah's history. We all know the last king of Judah was this fellow Zedekiah. He was preceded by Jehoiachin, the son of Jehoiakim, who ruled for three months. And then, of course, uh, before Jehoiakim, we had Jehoahaz, and before that, the wonderful king 
Josiah. Well, Ezekiel is beginning to prophesy in what he calls, in verse 2, the fifth year of King Jehoiachin's captivity. So here we have Jehoiachin's captivity, this line here, and five years after that is when Ezekiel chapter 1, verses 1 and 2, is recorded. Got it? But he also calls it in verse 1, the 30th year. Now some think that this is the age of Ezekiel, that he was a priest, and priests began their ministry at age 30. Well, if that's the case, why does he give you two dates? So it just doesn't make sense. This is not about Ezekiel's, Ezekiel's age. This is about the year that he wants you to focus on, that the Spirit wants you to focus on. He wants you to step back 30 years. And when you do step back 30 years, guess where you come to? To the 18th year of Josiah. The year of the great Passover of Josiah. You remember that year? You know what happened in that year? They found the only remaining copy of the book of the law in the land of Judah, stuck in the corner of the temple, cemented in. And they found it, they took it to the king, he said, oh, we're having serious trouble. So he sends a delegation to hold of the prophetess, and the message comes back from God, you are in serious trouble. Because of what Manasseh did, my judgments are sure and certain. Your nation, Josiah, is doomed. The judgments are coming, but you, you will be in the kingdom, Josiah. And I'm going to kill you so you don't see the judgments that are coming. And 13 years later, Pharaoh Necho came up from Egypt. Josiah went out against him. He didn't come home alive. 39 years of age. He was dead. Because God didn't want him to see the dreadful things that would happen to Judah because of the sins of Manasseh. But he'll be in the kingdom. So you see, this was the year that destinies were determined. Josiah's destiny was determined. His people's destiny was determined. The nation's destiny was determined. It's the year signifying for you and me when our destinies will be determined. That happens in the year of our resurrection, if we've died. If we're alive and remain, it's the year of our destiny being determined. I want you to come to Ezekiel chapter 40. I'm going to step into the future a little bit. Ezekiel chapter 40 in verse 1. How's that thinking cap going? You've got to sort of pull down firmly. So the brain's ticking over okay. You're right. Good on you, David. I knew you'd nod. Ezekiel chapter 40, verse 1. In the five and twentieth year of our captivity, he says, in the beginning of the year, so what's the beginning of the year to a Hebrew? Abib. Isn't it? In the tenth day of the month, so this is the tenth of Abib. What happened on the tenth of Abib, you know? They took a lamb. Each family took a lamb and corralled it for five days until the 14th of April when it was made a meal, wasn't it? The Passover lamb. So this is the time of Passover. Yes, let's read on. It was the 40th, sorry, the 14th year after the city was smitten. Now here's the fall of Jerusalem in 587 BC in the 11th year of Zedekiah. It was 14 years, he says, after the fall of Jerusalem. But you see, he's also told us at the beginning of that verse, it was the 5 and 20th year of Jehoiachin's captivity. So we've got to come on another 20 years. Because you see, he began to prophesy in the 5th year of Jehoiachin's captivity. This is the 25th year and 14 years after the city fell. Well, that's interesting, isn't it? Because what we've got now is a period of 30 years and 20 years. A total of 50 years to the day. Because Josiah held his great Passover in the 18th year 
exactly in terms of the law. So he took lambs on the 10th of AD, in the 18th year of his reign. And exactly 50 years later, the events that Ezekiel records in chapter 40 onwards occurred. So what is he recording? Well, let's read on. It says, The hand of God was upon me, and he brought me hither. Verse 2. In the visions of, ooh, Elohim, in the visions of mighty ones, it says, he brought me into the land of Israel and sent me not upon, but near, as the word, or towards a very high mountain. What very high mountain do you think that might be? Well, the exalted Mount Zion. And what does he find when he comes near this very high mountain by which it says, or thereupon, as it should read, was as the frame of a city from the south. Ezekiel has been positioned to the south of the exalted Mount Zion. Forty years after its exaltation, when the temple is complete and about to be used for international worship. How do we know that? Well, turn the page to verse... 39, sorry, verse 43 of Ezekiel chapter 40. We could read from verse 39, but we haven't got time. This is about the north gate, the, the gate of sacrifice in the temple. Come down to verse 43. And within, he says, this is in the porch of the temple on the north side, were hooks and hand broad, fastened round about. And upon the tables was the flesh of the offering. Now you don't cut up animals and leave them on tables for a long time. You use them the same day. In other words, this house is about to go into service. It's about to be inaugurated. You know the very first thing that's going to happen when that house is complete and before sacrifices are offered on that altar. You know what the very first thing Christ is going to do? He's going to walk his bride around that house because that's what he does with Ezekiel and Ezekiel is a man of sign he's a representative man so when all the judgments are passed and all the nations are subdued and the house is now complete he's going to say to his bride come on, come back, come back to Jerusalem all of you, I want you here and I'm going to walk you around this house this is our house, it's our new home we're going to share as a married couple, share a home. And you walk them around. She says, look at that. Look at that. It's exactly what this man, who was the builder of this house in chapter 40, this man, this ish, Christ, is going to do with his bride. Just as it happened in the days of Ezekiel. So how long? How long will it be after the resurrection before Christ can walk his bride around the completed house? Exactly 50 years. That's what it's telling us. If you want to follow this up, read the second chapter of Brother Sully's wonderful book on the Temple of Ezekiel's Prophecy. I've had brethren come to me and say, Oh, you know, I don't know about that. You know what I said to them? I said, Go and get Brother Sully's book, read chapter 2, then really look hard at Ezekiel, and come back and tell me what you think. You know, every single one of them has come back and said, you know, he's right. And I said, yeah, I know he's right. He is right. And the Bible's telling us something. There's a 50-year period. Now, why wouldn't that be the case? Because over here, destinies were determined in the 18th year of Josiah. And 50 years later, the temple is seen to be open for service. And the bride has walked around it. So you see, when you go back to this chart, here's the resurrection, 50 years later, the marriage supper of the Lamb is held, Christ walks his bride around the house before he invites the nations to come in and to start their worship in that place. You know, when we go back and have a look at the experience of Ezekiel himself, it's identical to that of John. I want you to come back to Ezekiel chapter 2 and 3. Ezekiel 2 and 3. 
In verse 9 of Ezekiel 2, we read this. And when I looked, he says, Behold, a hand was sent unto me, and lo, a roll of a book was therein. So there's a hand with a scroll in it. Just like John saw the mighty angel with a scroll open in his hand. It says in verse 10, And he spread it before me. So this scroll was opened up, and it was written within and without, and there was written therein lamentations and mourning and woe. In other words, divine judgments against his own people. So what was Ezekiel supposed to do with this scroll? We'll read verse 1 of chapter 3. Moreover he said unto me, Son of man, eat that thou findest. Eat this roll, and go speak unto the house of Israel. So he's invited to eat the scroll. Now this all lines up with John, doesn't it? Ezekiel saw a scroll. John saw a scroll open in the angel's hand. It was written on both sides of the divine judgments. The one in Revelation chapter 10, verses 3 and 4, contains seven thunder judgments. Ezekiel is invited to eat the scroll. And in verse 8, John is invited to take and to eat the scroll. So what does Ezekiel find? We'll look at verse 3. He says, And he said unto me, Son of man, cause thy belly to eat, and fill thy bowels with this roll that I give thee. Then did I eat it, and it was in my mouth. As coming for sweetness. In other words, Ezekiel agreed. He agreed with God's judgments against his own people. Do you reckon he felt comfortable about that? Or was that bitter to Ezekiel? Judgments upon his own people in which he was going to be involved. Or well, it was bitter. Have a look at verse 14 of Ezekiel chapter 3. So the Spirit lifted me up and took me away and I went in bitterness in the heat of my spirit that the hand of Yahweh was upon me. Brothers and sisters, it's not going to be a pleasant experience to have to pour out divine judgments. It will be bitter. But it will also be right. And because it's right, and we know it's right, it's sweet in our mouth. See the point of that? Now, this is really living, isn't it, in the vision of the kingdom. We've got Ezekiel and John being asked to eat scrolls. So I've arranged tonight, afterwards, you're not going to have cakes. No, no cakes. Well, I've got some parchment. And we've cut it up into small pieces. And you're all going to eat it. And you'll enjoy it. It'll be sweet in your mouth. The terrible mistake. Got the point of that? You've got to live in the vision of the kingdom. This is what happened to John. It's got to happen to you and me. You need to take the initiative. I'll tell you something that's not going to happen, young people. Nobody, nobody is going to get hold of your arm and put it up behind your back and frog march you into the kingdom. It's not going to happen. But you can propel yourself into the kingdom by approaching the angel and saying, I want to be there. I want to be there. Give me that scroll. That's what this is teaching us. And where does it culminate? Have a look. Come back to Revelation chapter 10, verse 11. Revelation chapter 10, and verse 11, we read this. He's found it sweet in his mouth and bitter, bitter in his belly. And he says this. He said unto me, Thou must prophesy again before many peoples and nations and tongues and kings. How many people think that that refers to the saints going out and preaching in the kingdom age? Most people think that. Not what it means. Brother Thomas says this in Eureka. After John, as the representative of all the saints, and that's what he was, had eaten up the little scroll, the judgments to be executed when the angel of the bow shall have been developed, he was told by the angel in vision that he must prophesy again against many peoples and nations and tongues and kings. The first work of the saints for 40 years plus is a work of prophesying against many peoples and nations and tongues. It's a work of judgment. And any careful reading of Revelation 10 demonstrates that that's true. It's the context. 
Now let me just very quickly, I see my time has disappeared there, and I know you can't wait to get downstairs and to get your parchment. <laughs> let, me just, let me just quickly run you through the events that are going to occur in which we, if we're there, are going to be involved. <coughs> we're going to see these things if we're not personally participating in that particular thing or be something else. We're going to see these things happen and the saints are going to come back and report to us what they were doing and we will report to them about what they were doing. When these things unfold, Christ will return to raise the dead and gather the, the living for judgment and he will take us to the place of judgment, which is beyond all dispute, is Sinai. And if you want proof of that, I'll give you an hour's talk on it and nail it to the floor, you'll never get it up. I can do that from the Bible. The place of judgment is Sinai. Forget this nonsense about Jerusalem. So here he is. He brings the dead and the living to the place of judgment. Elijah is sent to Jews living outside the land of Israel. He doesn't have a role amongst the Jews in the land. That's also clear from Bible prophecy. And the events that lead to Armageddon, of course, are Daniel chapter 11, 40b, the second half of verse 40 through to verse 45, Ezekiel 38, Zechariah 14, Joel chapter 3, Genesis chapter 14. You can go on and on and on. The Bible's full of it. The Gogin Confederacy comes down from the north with many ships, it says in Daniel chapter 11. They also come down the coastal plain of Israel and they plunge into Egypt. That's their first target, Isaiah 19. Yahweh will deliver the Egyptians into the hand of a cruel lord, it says in verse 4 of that chapter. And here he is, he's arrived. But he's not there all that long. Because tidings out of the east troubled him. Because Christ and the saints begin the subjugation of the Sinai Arabs to receive the fleeing Jews from the battle of Armageddon. And tidings, of course, come from the north because the Western powers or the Tarshish powers are ensconcing themselves in and around Jerusalem. But first of all, Gog is victorious. He does conquer Egypt. The ships of Tarshish are destroyed with an east wind, says Psalm 48, verse 7. That east wind, of course, is the Russian navy. It's based in Syria. They have two bases in Syria. You know what the Syrians were called in the Bible? The east wind. Well, they destroy the British fleet in the eastern Mediterranean. They've got to come around through the Persian Gulf. So the Western nations come around through the Persian Gulf, their allies, and they fortify Jerusalem. And Russia, hearing the news from the east and hearing the news from the north, takes his main forces out of Egypt, comes back to Jerusalem. And there he defeats the Tarshish powers. He's victorious, says Daniel chapter 11. He sets the tent of his power in my glorious holy mountain between the seas. But he will come to his end. And none shall help him. Because Christ will be there shortly to deal with him. But he's got a work to do amongst the Egyptians first. He's got to smite and heal Egypt. So he sends a company, probably led by himself, if not by himself, by Joseph. And he goes into Egypt to begin the work of converting that nation. It will take him 40 years and it will be hard work. The Jews are defeated along with the Tarshish powers and many of the Jews are taken into captivity or flee south to be received by the Arabs. They're Arab brethren who have been prepared by the saints to receive them. And then of course we have Christ advancing from Sinai to Jerusalem as described so beautifully in Deuteronomy 33 verse 2, Psalm 68 and Habakkuk chapter 3. And he finally arrives at the Mount of Olives splits in two. Half to go, goes towards the north and half toward the south. And the forces of the invader are decimated in the land. And the fleeing Jews will then return to meet their Messiah. And then he will send out the saints for ten years in the mid-heaven proclamation demanding the subjection of all people. And of course we know what's going to happen. The Pope and his people will bring their doctrine of Antichrist into view. And they will convince their people that this imposter in Jerusalem is the Antichrist of their doctrine. And they will oppose him for the next 40 years. Sensible nations like Britain will submit to Christ's rule. 
For 40 years there was intense activity in that land. It's cleansed, it's divided. The foundations of the temple are laid. Catholic Europe is judged in the hour of judgment as Israel makes its way back through Europe. Now I was going to go and talk about all of that, but I'm not going to do that now. It's too late. And I know you can't wait to get your pain. However, let me just say this. These are the true realities. And they're about to happen. All the signs indicate that Christ is just a hair's breadth away. You know why? And if you want, and I haven't got time to do that while I'm here at London, you want to see the proof of this, then ask me for a DVD of my prophecy update at Richmond, and I'll be happy to give you one. Now, if that doesn't convince you that Christ is about to come, then nothing will. Brothers and sisters and young people, he is about to appear, and we need to be living in the vision of the kingdom.